Okay, our next topic is uh, has been alluded to some, and that's on secure beef supply plans. And this is really a new effort. And and Dr. Brian Vanderlei, um, many of you may know, is a veterinarian at, at uh, the University of Nebraska GP Vet, the Great Plains Vet at Veterinary Education Center. Um, and I think is a collaboration and, and really working through Nebraska Department of Ag and, and trying to develop uh, this planning tool for feed yards to use, which he'll describe in great detail. So Brian, thanks for doing this. Thanks for the introduction. So just to give you guys a quick look at what we're gonna talk about today, I really um, wanna start with why. I think these are important. We're gonna talk about foreign animal disease and foot and mouth disease. And you may hear me using FMD and FAD interchangeably at some point. So forgive me. And if there's ever any confusion, just go ahead and ask, uh, put it in the chat, whatever you're most comfortable with. So we're gonna talk about why, what, and how. Why I think we're gonna talk, um, the why for me is really about building resilience in our livestock production systems. That's important for you as a producer to, to stay in business. And it's very important for our food security as a, as a nation. And foot and mouth disease is a, is a terrible disease. And we'll get into that just a little bit. What is, is going to be about how a, or, or what a secure beef supply plan is going to do for you in the event we have a foreign animal disease like FMD. And then we'll get into some specifics about how you go about building one of these secure beef supply plans. So I've, I've been thinking a lot about the idea of resilience, uh, especially in 2020, where we, in 2019, we've had, we've had some, some black swan events. And I, I've, I came up with these three levels. So I'm, I'm really interested in uh, any disagreement or feedback that I can get on these, but I think of kind of step one resilience building in our systems as being coming up with a contingency plan. So a plan about what you're gonna do when things don't go the way you plan them to. And then we can talk about those other two, but basically two other ways to build resilience are um, reserve accumulation or saving for a rainy day and diversification. But we're really gonna focus on contingency planning today. So why is this important um, here? in in Nebraska and across the U.S., we've we've uh, started to see flocks of black swans instead of just one or two uh, once in a while. Uh, a couple of things that come to mind readily are the Tyson um, fire down in Kansas that sent our beef markets into a tailspin when it really only changed about or uh, it, it only changed the the packing supply or the packing capacity. Um, relatively minorly for a fairly short period of time. That's evidence to me that we have a pretty efficient system about that that's good at moving beef through the supply chain in adjusted time fashion. So it, it's, it's good at that job, but when we perturb the system and we introduce some, some uncertainty or something that's unforeseen, uh, we get pretty big swings really quickly. I don't have to tell anybody about COVID, um, COVID has created some interesting dynamics in beef production. And then here in Nebraska, another thing that it's not on the slide here, but it's also part of why I, I think a lot more about resilience is we had the two bomb cyclones a couple of years ago in, in basically just a, a couple week period of time. And those types of things um, are traumatic to get through, they're difficult. And sometimes that's made worse by the fact that we haven't really even thought about what we're going to do when bad things happen. So when we talk about foot and mouth disease and why I think it's important for us to put foot and mouth disease uh, secure beef supply plans in place is kind of got to understand how a foot and mouth disease outbreak is going to look. So this little graphic right here is pulled from, uh, it's adapted from the Foot and mouth disease red book. So that's the USDA plan for how the US will respond to a foot and mouth disease outbreak. And here's kind of what you can expect to happen. The first day after a case is identified or a suspect's identified. So somebody's gonna see one of these suspect cases somewhere. They're gonna notice that an animal's got little blisters on its its mouth, its lips, its tongue, or maybe around its coronary bands near its hooves. 
maybe in dairy cows, they might see them on some teats, but in one way or another, they're gonna see those blisters or the evidence that the blisters used to be there. And immediately that's gonna drive a foreign animal disease investigation. As soon as that gets reported, uh, a FAD investigation has to occur, which involves <clears throat> immediately quarantining all the animals that are on that premise. So if, it, if that happens at a sale barn, all the animals that are at the sale barn that day are gonna stay right there until the results of that investigation are known. It happens at a feedlot or a dairy or a swine barn, same thing applies. Everything that's there is gonna stay right there until they get an answer. Those samples usually go to Plum Island. Uh, that may change in the future, but right now, all the, conf the confirmatory samples for foot and mouth go to Plum Island, uh, New York, to the national, um, the USDA disease lab. And immediately, even as that process is, is ongoing, they're gonna start tracing contacts from that suspect premise forward and backward. So backward means they're gonna look for animals that have recently showed up, try to figure out where they came from and see if there's more cases. And forward is looking at animals that left that premise and seeing if the disease went with them to the premises they went to after that. So it doesn't take very long to get confirmation. Usually it's about uh, 24 hours, give or take a, a few hours. And as soon as we get into a confirmed state where we know we have a case of real foot and mouth disease in the US, they're gonna establish a control area around the infected premise. So most of the time, these are, they're, at first they're gonna be circles. Um, they're about six miles in diameter. And everything in that control area is gonna be shut down completely. There will be no movement um, that will be driven or that will be maintained by the incident command system, which includes all kinds of first responders like um, highway patrol, local law enforcement, things like that. And it's very likely with foot and mouth disease that we'll probably have a national stop movement order, which means that there will be a period of time that we have to get animals that are in transit off the road. But after that, we're gonna go at least three days without moving animals anywhere. And the reason for that is that the, the people who are gonna be looking for foot and mouth disease, um, state animal health officials and USDA are going to be um, trying to figure out how far this virus spread before we picked it up. So they're gonna look for other infected premises during that three days and it may stretch a bit longer. And as soon as that starts closing down where they feel like they know where the virus went, there'll be a transition to a permitting system. So after the stop movement order expires, it won't be like you can just go back to doing things the way they used to be because they wanna make sure that they know where animals have come from and where they're going to so that they can track disease effectively. There'll be a really, um, it'll be a pretty in-depth permitting system that will help state animal health officials and USDA um, understand where animals are coming and going from. So as we go into this phase two, and we know how big the outbreak is and permitted movement starts, we'll go into a, a pretty long period, most likely of, of uh, disease response that could take a number of different shapes depending on how far and uh, wide it's spread. So what's this gonna look like for your operation? If you happen to be outside of one of the control zones, so the, the six to 10 mile circle around an infected premise, you're gonna experience a few things uh, with quite, like um, there's quite a bit of certainty that these, these things are gonna happen. Um, first, we're definitely gonna experience a very abrupt interruption of international trade. A lot of countries in the US have gone to great trouble to eradicate foot and mouth and other foreign animal diseases. And they're not gonna be willing to take the risk of importing any beef products from us or pork or, um, uh, small ruminant, all those are, are uh, potentially infected. So anything with a cloven hoof can be infected by foot and mouth disease. So that includes um, container ships that are crossing the ocean that are in transit with products that have been um, shipped to, to foreign markets. 
those things are very likely to get turned around and sent back. So we'll, we'll experience not only an interruption of international trade, but we'll also have a, a huge oversupply pretty quickly of, of meat to consume in the United States. You can pretty much guarantee based on the, the performance of the futures markets in the last couple of years that there's going to be some pretty um, concerning panic driven futures trading for a while that, that will probably stabilize over time. But we are also going to experience an immediate loss of livestock value. It's because the, the amount of money that export markets put into our, our value chain and the fact that we are going to have a significant overproduction compared to the demand in a very um, quick time frame that will be hard to adapt to. And then it's pretty likely that you're going to have issues with moving livestock and feed and getting access to necessary goods and services because these control zones are where the, the focus is going to be. But once foot and mouth disease is here, there's probably going to be heightened efforts to, to control any kind of disease spread. And we've got experience with this too now as a result of, of COVID. We've all experienced infection control measures firsthand. If you happen to be inside a control zone, you're going to have everything that goes on outside the control zone. Plus, you have an increased risk of actual foot and mouth disease. And you are guaranteed to have to use a permit-based system if you're going to move livestock for sure and potentially even feed and other um, goods and services. So it, it may take a permit to get a vet on a place or something like that, uh, because they're gonna wanna be very, the, the people who are in charge of controlling an outbreak, um, do that in part by understanding where things have moved so that they can quickly trace sources of infection back and control them or forward and get ahead of them. So how bad really is foot and mouth disease? We talk about this. I've heard people say that the disease is not nearly as bad as the control. And that, that may or may not be true depending on what kind of cattle or livestock you have. So in cattle, we'll have pretty much 100% morbidity in infected herd. There's almost um, no way to get around that because our cattle are completely naive as of now. There's no foot and mouth disease here in the US, nor is there any cattle, nor are there any cattle that have been vaccinated. And the statistics in young animals or in cattle that are infected is that in young animals, we'll probably see up to 20% mortality. So that's probably pre weaning age and younger. And we'll also um, see potentially up to 5% mortality in adults, averages between one and 5%. There's also a lot of chronic sequela to foot and mouth disease infections that include things like chronic lameness, uh, heart problems, loss of ability to maintain body temperature, and there's also uh, kind of these chronic shedder, um, just ill thrift type animals. So even though we're, we're going to have most animals recover, there's a period of time probably two weeks to four weeks where they're going to be really, they're going to be really lame and they're going to have mouths that are full of, of uh, ulcers that came from these vesicles when they, when they pop. You can see in these pictures that they'll slough off. This is a, this is one of the vesicles that popped and left basically a big ulcer right on the end of this cow's tongue or on the side of the tongue right here. And they also get the same thing happening in between their toes. You can see in this picture. So they're, these animals are not going to want to eat. Um, they're not going to move around very well, but they probably will recover. And in some ways, that probably will help offset oversupply. That's going to be a, a result of this. But it is a really bad disease. Um, the disease is, and it's, it's incredibly infectious, one of the most infectious viruses that, that we know of. So because it's going to be widespread and the, and the mortality is what it is, it'll still be really painful all by itself. So what can you do about this? Um, one of the things that's available, and this has been developed because the USDA and state animal health officials recognized that control, controlling a foreign animal disease is going to be incredibly disruptive to livestock operations uh, to the point where it might, 
It certainly will threaten individual livestock systems, uh, individual livestock operations and their financial viability. And it may get to the point of threatening uh, US food security. So they created secure food supply plans of which uh, secure beef is one of these. They also have secure pork, secure poultry, and uh, secure dairy. And I believe they're working on a secure small ruminant uh, supply plan. But really what these plans are designed to do is provide an operation with a continuity of business plan in the event of a foreign animal disease. So they have a few critical functions. First, and probably most importantly, uh, these plans include an enhanced biosecurity uh, plan that allows producers to minimize the risk of introducing foot and mouth or other foreign animal diseases to their, their uh, production system. It provides a critical basis for obtaining permits to keep livestock moving. So the state animal health officials that I've had the chance to visit with about this have indicated that in the event that we have a foot and mouth disease or other foreign animal disease, they're going to require that an, in, an operation has one of these in place before they can issue a permit. If they don't have one of these during the break, it's gonna be really hard to get a secure beef supply plan and therefore it might be really challenging to move cattle at all. They also contribute to the early detection by providing training on clinical signs um, for uh, feedlot personnel or, or the employees of a ranch. And it, that is one of the most important mitigation steps. The quicker we, we identify these cases and get them under control, the less impact it'll have uh, in the country. And then it also includes some really important considerations for managing disruptions related to foot, foreign animal disease control. So things like um, if we have a three-day supply of distiller's grains on hand and the truck can't come for a week, what are we going to do? Or we're, we're accustomed to drop shipping um, veterinary supplies like vaccines the day before we're going to process. What are we going to do if the delivery, the delivery truck isn't allowed to, to show up on the place? So it includes a lot of features like that. So how do you do this? The first step is to get a premises identification number from the Nebraska Department of Ag. This is pretty easy to do. I've got the uh, screenshot of the website here. You can call this number 402-471-2351 and have this information. So they're gonna want an, an address, a mailing address, as well as a physical address for where the animals are if it's different than the mailing address. If you don't have an address for a particular location, they will accept driving directions or GPS coordinates. All the secure beef supply plans actually um, have a spot to put GPS coordinates in and they're pretty easy to get. You just go to Google Earth and uh, click on your operation on Google Earth right down in the, in the little information pane at the very, very bottom of the screen, there'll be a, a set of GPS coordinates. You need some contact names and numbers for people and you can provide email addresses if, if you'd like to. So getting a premise ID is pretty easy. Next step is to develop an enhanced biosecurity plan that has three basic features that have a lot of details associated with each of them. Uh, most importantly is probably the access or I, I don't wanna say most importantly, but probably most challenging is access control. So this involves developing a line of separation, which you can think of as a, a wall or a moat around a castle, and you have to build in access points uh, to cross that wall. So you can think of those a little bit like drawbridges, and you need three of them. You need one for livestock to get across the line, you need one for vehicles to get across the line, and one for people to get across the line. Each of those latter two, the vehicles and the people, require some protocols for cleaning and disinfection. For instance, if a vehicle is going to go from outside the yard to inside the yard, it'll have to go through a cleaning process that probably involves power washing, and then it'll have to be disinfected with an approved uh, product that's labeled for the pathogen that we're dealing with. So if it's foot and mouth disease, that could be something like um, concentrate or uh, pre-concentrated bleach. It's not um, neat bleach, but it's uh, pretty strong compared to what we usually use, or uh, other products like Beercon. Um, there's a couple others. 
And then if for people, it will require things like clothes changing facilities and potentially shower facilities. Um, it'll require having some dedicated clothing that people wear onside the operation or inside the operation versus outside. And it also includes some risk identification and mitigation uh, procedures to make sure, you know, things like um, rodent control is a risk factor for spreading disease on an operation. Or they, they ask a question, which is, is a tough one to say you can, can do, but it includes questions about wildlife control on the premise. So there are fillable templates available to do this that make it pretty easy. There's one at the securebeef.org website made specifically for beef producers. You can also get them from us at UNL Extension. I'll give you some contact information at the end of this presentation or from uh, the Nebraska Department of Ag. Step three is to uh, develop a detailed premises map that includes that line of separation and the access points I talked about. It, it has to include those um, cleaning and disinfection areas and a few other infection control procedures. And we always include mortality management in here. Um, you can still use a rendering truck to haul off uh, mortalities during an outbreak. But our feeling here at, at uh, GPBC is that the last vehicle you want showing up at your place during an infectious disease break is the uh, the truck that hauls all the failures. So we, we try to find ways to dispose of mortalities in a, in a legal way on the premise, which usually is composting or something like that. Last step to getting one of these is to send it to the Nebraska Department of Ag to get it reviewed and approved. Chelsea Harris is the, the NDA emergency response coordinator and she's the one who approves these plans. It's really important to point out that NDA does not maintain copies of these plans because they want to make sure that they're not uh, subject to freedom of information requests. They contain a lot of sensitive information uh, that, that uh, people could use uh, in, in poor ways if gotten a hold of. So they don't want to even take that risk. So what they do is that once they approve a plan, they delete all the copies they have and add the operations name to a list of, of operations that has an approved plan. And then they'll occasionally uh, ask for renewals. I think it's once every three years where they'll want those to be revisited and reapproved. So that pretty much makes the operation responsible for maintaining the plan. Um, we have recently, as uh, Dr. Erickson alluded to, gotten some funding through Nebraska Department of Ag to help um, operations develop these plans. So if you are interested in building a secure beef supply plan for your operation, we are we are really willing to help. Um, you can get a hold of me. Uh, I have my email and cell phone number here. I always tell people you're welcome to call my cell phone, but I'm not a real vet anymore. So if you call at two in the morning, I hope you've got an alternative emergency plan in mind. Uh, you can also email either Dr. Funk or Dr. Clark. They're the two um, faculty here at Great Plains. This summer, we'll be working with several interns. Uh, I have one of them listed here. We have three others as well that will be helping kind of work through the logistics of getting these plans in place. We'll have a good team of people this summer available uh, to help get these plans built and approved for you if you're interested. You can also get a hold of me if you have uh, other questions about secure beef supply plans or, or uh, biosecurity at feedlots. So, that's all I have, Dr. Erickson. Find any questions for Brian? I'll leave my contact up here for just a minute. We'll see any in the chat. We talked before about satellite yards and, and challenges with that, Brian. I don't remember you mentioning it unless I missed it. <laughs> no, I forgot to mention that one. So there. Um, we last time we talked about how almost every feedlot has a, has a little satellite somewhere. They've got a few pins that are off by themselves. Um, further, you know, close, there's a lot of difference, a lot of variation of distance, but there's two things about that that are probably important to think about relative to a secure beef supply plant. I have to check with the, um, the folks at NDA exactly, but I think some of those are probably far enough away to require 
almost their own secure beef supply plan where they need a, a unique premises ID. One of the problems that we run into with satellite yards is that um, they're going to pose a lot of problems with this enhanced biosecurity plan because they, they require um, travel like a feed truck's got to move across public road or use a public road to get from where they load feed at the main yard to the satellite yard to feed. When you're operating with a secure beef supply plan and the enhanced biosecurity, you'll have to clean and disinfect that truck every time it goes from outside to inside the operation. So that'll mean it'll have to be clean and disinfected when it arrives at the satellite and then clean and disinfected again when it arrives back at the main yard. We don't consider that viable because cleaning and disinfection is gonna be, it's gonna have several um, challenges associated with it. One is you gotta have the equipment. You're gonna have to have power washers. You're gonna have to have a place to do it where all the water can be um, effectively drained away from the, the site of cleaning and disinfection while also being captured. Um, we're still getting some feedback from the Department of Environment and Energy to find out how that's gonna be handled. Uh, we definitely don't want that runoff from the C&D station going into the yard because it could be a source of infection if it's contaminated. But that'll be a challenge. Um, the, the disinfectants are generally corrosive. Uh, they would not be good for equipment if applied frequently. And uh, they usually have a, a significant um, soak time that's required. So things like bleach and beer con usually require about a 20 minute soak before they can be removed in order to be effective. It varies depending on which one you're using. So the, the idea of, of routinely cleaning and disinfecting something like a feed truck uh, just doesn't seem very viable. So we've looked at other options. One option that works in some cases is we basically make the bunk line at the satellite yard the line of separation so that we can we can have a dirty feed truck that we can load across the line at the main yard and then dump feed into the bunk essentially across the line. Another strategy we've used is <clears throat> having a, a dedicated feed truck at the satellite if there's an extra truck. Some yards are uh, they have a, a spare truck around or um, in some cases, it might be most fruitful just to move the cattle to the main yard and, and get them out of the satellite yard in order to limit the amount of cleaning and disinfection that needs to be done. Okay, thank you, Brian.